Uh, the, the, uh, the, the making of movie is called Tape 606. <laughs> So, um, another reason for, for coming up with a cute name is, is, you know, I've got to sell this to you guys and to get people involved. So let, let's, let's get the marketing out, out of the way first, you know, uh, so I don't have to put too much fire up your nose. So, what's called, well, the first thing about COG is, of course, it's a logo. <laughs> so, found this the other day, I was trying to find out you know, what's my image going to be for Cog. And she put it. You've seen the one with, with the single gear and the three equally sized gears, that's easy. But, you know, apparently, nobody can find an exact solution because this is the guesswork to find the, uh, the four ratios. So, yeah. I was thinking, okay, I know exactly what I want. I want that in 3D with kind of perspective and a kind of a metallic look. And what I want is the big thing to be a C and the little thing in the middle to be an O and then the other to be a G. And I was thinking, this is going to take forever. I don't know anything about 3D. And I was chatting with my friend Dan Lanavanas, and uh, Dan was my colleague in first time at Park Place. And he um, has this fantastic blog and has been doing 3D stuff for a long time. And um, he sent me an email with uh, the thing that Jonathan Lombardi had done, which is kind of a, a, a croquet ball with a, a cog around it, superimposed on Rodin's thinker. And it's cute, but it's you know, not, not my thing. And Dan said, is this, is this what you want? I said, no, no, actually what I want is, and I sent him the looming gears, he said, I'll do it. So, um, this is what Dan did for me. And uh, this isn't finished yet, but, but this, is the, uh, this is the movie.
to uh, be interpreter for small machines. I'd like, I'd like the Pasquia and an interpreter to be able to be, coexist. Um, and I, so I'm not changing the compiler. I'm not trying to, to uh, push aside the existing VM. I'm, I'm trying to keep uh, various elements the same, like the image format, etc. But I have some targets, um, and the, the most important targets speed-wise are um, an HPS style fast chip. HPS is the highly portable small talk, or his new piece of small talk, uh, which is the visual works VM. And uh, after that, I want to do a, a self-style uh, adaptive optimizer, which targets uh, all floating point performance. There are other things to do, um, which is to integrate with, with Hydra, which is Igor Stasenko's approach to um, multi-core, which is to have multiple um, squeak images running in separate threads with good inter-process communication as a, as a workaround for, for using uh, multi-core, which I think is good. And um, is completely orthogonal to, to my VM, so I should be able to have cold VMs in Hydra. And I'm also uh, concerned that um, Craig Latter's work with, with small uh, images, uh, I play well with that. So fast, quick, that's a fast car. That's a quick car. So it's like twice the uh, twice the power, almost three times the power to weight, twice the speed to 60, but round the track. Is 25% faster, which is interesting because it's kind of on paper it's three times as fast, or it's two times as fast. But in real work, you only get 25% faster actual performance. It's kind of much the way it is with real benchmarks. You get some benchmark and you make something faster, but when you apply it to some real problem, uh, you don't get that that level of benefit. The program actually has to do real work, and you're only optimizing the, the overheads. But you know, hence fast for HPS and, and quick for self. So um, there are some prerequisites. You need um, closures because these affect the way that you can represent uh, the stack inside the machine and have an internal stack organization. And then if you want to uh, do self, you need uh, inline caches, one more thing, one more thing, inline caches to get your uh, type information. So that might be a mountain, but I've got to find some way of breaking it down into some small steps. So Andreas has said to me, why not do um, a VM which is halfway along to the fast VM? Uh, so that's the kind of direction. So what I've done so far is to implement closures within the current squeak, um, which is a very simple extension, just adds a few new byte bytecodes, and um, that has involved a few changes to the front end and replacing the back end. It's been very easy because the current squeak compiler already supports ANSI syntax for, for blocks. And the compiler hasn't changed from when I first worked on it with, with Bruhaha. It's really nice. It's the same structure. It's very familiar. And of course, not writing a whole new compiler is a lot less work. Um, and one of the fun things that happened is actually when you, when you do closures, you don't need block context. You really have, have one context class. So that's actually uh, finished now. And um, if you go to my blog and the downloads, you can get the bootstrap for Croquet 1 and Squeak 3.9, and somebody may be working on Squeak 3.10. And um, as of last week, we deployed it internally at Quack, and so it will probably become our uh, production uh, environment in September. Um, so the next step is to break down getting a visual work style JIT <coughs> in place. Um, and the crucial thing to do is to um, is to be able to map activations to stack records. So if you have a look, 
from the classic inject into. Um, this guy gets modified in the execution of this block. And this guy is declared here. So if you do a naive implementation, uh, this assignment needs a special bytecode to reach out of this block and go down the, the static chain until you get to the home context and access the temporary there. And the, the problem with that is that, you know, this is small talk, you don't know who could grab hold of reference to this. So next could outlive the execution of the inject into. So you get into all sorts of problems if next lives there, that whenever you exit this, you have to make sure that the next value is accessible to this block and still up to date. So um, this gets in the way of a clean mapping of uh, activations to stack frames in the VM. And so the, the standard transformation, which uh, I did first in, in VisualWorks, which is from, from this implementations, is to put all such shared temps, like next, in their own heap allocated cell. So for each jump level, you find some heap cells to store as many variables as you need. Uh, in this case, we only need one for next. And then uh, we store, store the, the value in this array. So here we assign to next, and here we're assigned to, to temp vector. And then when we do this, this, this block, we access the temp vector to extract the value here and to put it back. So now what we've done is arrange that temp vector is copied by this block but it's not modified by this block. Here, next is, is modified by this block. So now this block only copies all external values. So it copies binary block, uh, and it copies uh, temp vector. So when you create this block, you can literally copy those values, and you can use copies local to this block. And now this block is absolutely independent of the enclosing activation. It holds onto this array, both activations can share the array, but once uh, this this guy has been returned from, this guy still this block still refers to head vector independently, and so that transformation allows you to map activations to stack frames very easily. So that's the point of the closure optimization. So to complete it, you kind of um, you need a, a block closure which holds on to some uh, outer context as you need the outer context chain for non-local return. And it's very like block context. It has the uh, array of values that it copies from its outer scopes. And then you need uh, new primitives to evaluate uh, these block closures. And um, I don't know if you can see that, but this is receiver map, which was an old variable in method context, which has been unused forever, it was supposed to be for multiple inheritance that is that is not used. So um, I've used it, and it's now closure or nil. So when you have a, a block activation, uh, closure or nil is not nil. It holds on to the, the block closure, and the block closure's out of context points to the next, and so on, chaining through closure or nil and out of context, closure or nil and out of context until you get to the home context. So you don't actually need block context anymore. So when you um, evaluate a block closure, you get a new method context whose closure or nil is set to the, the block closure. It was very simple to do. And so you need five new bytecodes. You need to um, create one of those arrays. Um, you need to create a, a closure. It's very similar to creating a, a, a block. <coughs> Slightly different. And then three. To, to store and fetch from those those vectors. What is then, a cons array? Sorry? What is a cons array? So cons array, oh yeah, I should say that. Um, this doesn't fit in a single byte because I need a size. So I've got two bytes. So I've got the code that says <laughs> this is a push new array and the following byte which says how many elements. Well, you don't need 256 elements. It's too many. 
so 128 elements is great. So what do you do with the other 128 elements? You have a push cons array. So what that does is create a new array and pop n elements off the stack to populate the array. And so that does brace constructs much faster than the conventional one and, and more compact. So this is two opcodes in one bytecode. It's kind of a difficult thing to do, but, but that's what it is. So this one creates an empty array, and this one creates an initialized array. It literally, whatever, whatever you put on the stack, those items now become the element of the, of the array. Um, so, and then the only other change you have to make to do, to do closures is that you have to modify the, uh, the return bytecodes to check if, if closure or nil is not nil, and if closure or nil is not nil, then you return from the home context and you walk that static chain. So, um, closures took about, about a month and uh, uh, six weeks with, with debugger work and all that kind of stuff. So, the next step from then to get to the VisualWorks chip is to write all of the stack mapping machinery. Now, the point of the stack mapping machinery is that um, the VM wants to use stack frames internally so that when you send a message, that compiles down to a call instruction. And it's like a conventional uh, call return in a conventional language. But the image still has this concept of, of context that still wants to use the context for everything, for the debugger and, and uh, uh, seaside and, and you know, uh, all of that stuff. So you have to arrange that these, these stack frames are, are things that can have context as proxies to them. Um, and that's quite complicated. Things like um, terminate to which walks an arbitrary number of contexts and nils out intervening contexts. Right. When you map that out onto stacks, where each stack is some number of stack frames, and you don't want to waste time looking at intervening pages because they can just be thrown away and stuff, you know, it gets hairy. So um, Andrea said, why don't you do an interpreter which has the same stack organization as, as the fast chip? Um, so that's what I'm working on now, and that's 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 kind of um, done. Um, for real sweet VM weenies, one of, one of the things that I had to do was get rid of, of this evilness. Uh, the sweet GC, when you allocate an object, if it runs out of space, the allocation code will run the garbage collector. So if you're a client in the VM and you call an allocation, all of your pointers may move. And so there's this real hack, which is you have to push all of your pointers on the stack before you call a new, and they roll <coughs> off afterwards because they may have changed. The one, the one allocation in a million that causes a garbage collection. So it's a horrible evilness. And uh, it's just too complicated in, in, in this kind of stack organization because you may create a, a, a context at all sorts of times when you're, when you're traversing the, the stack. And it's way too difficult to, to maintain that. So I had to streamline the GC a little bit and, and get rid of this. Um, so, what does a uh, stack frame look like in the in the stack VM? So, it's very close to uh, what the um, what the fast chip will have, but uh, the essential difference is that you know this is this is a stack and it grows down, and so at some stage you push a receiver and you push some arguments and then you send a message, and from that point you you build the frame. So you uh, push the the instruction pointer to save it and you. Uh, remember the, the saved frame and then a method and then need some flags and um, you don't have a context right right now so, so this field is left to hold the, the context that's associated with this field I think it's going to be a proxy for it and this, this doesn't have any meaning until this flag is set um, now in a, in a JIT you know you know at compile time where the, where the receiver is and you know how many arguments you've got but in an interpreter, you don't. So it's uh, it's too expensive to reach down, find out the number of arguments to find the receiver <coughs> all the time. So in the interpreter, there's this duplication that once you've built the frame, you also push the receiver to something that wouldn't be necessary in the JIT. And so this is used for accessing instance variables. But um, to grab an argument, the, the interpreter actually has to fetch the number of arguments and subtract it from here to find out where an argument is. So unfortunately in this interpreter, the argument access is, a, is actually slower in the interpreter. And that, that's, that's a pain. Um, 
companion because argument access is very important. Um, but we gain because there's no argument copying here. So as you're, you're building up the outgoing parameters for your next send, they become the incoming receiver and arguments for the, for the frame. And there's, there's no copying. And we don't have to create a context on each uh, activation or return. So this is really, really close from the organization that we have um, in the fast chip. And in any case, maybe the two will coexist because having an interpreter while you have a JIT means that you don't have to JIT huge methods. You can leave those to the interpreter. There's lots of benefits there to keeping the existing interpreter around. So the stack interpreter is kind of done. I use it for my daily work. And I'm going to do a blog post on its design real soon. And its performance has been underwhelming. We see some benchmarks 10% faster, the occasional benchmark 68% faster, but no real impact on the client experience. You may be a little slower. And um, it's kind of a mystery because you know, it's, it's, it's obviously faster. Okay. But, uh, but not, not at all. So um, uh, I've just <laughs> done another horrible hack, because, which is you know, this guy. You need one of these guys. This is a, a, a PC sampling statistical profiler. And this is the, the bytecode interpreter loop for uh, optimizing, for, for executing uh, Fibonacci. So this is probably the bytecode dispatch loop right here. There's some stuff that we don't know yet. And this, this tool is too green right now to, to give me labels. So, um, But we haven't had a VM profiler in, in Squeak for a, for a long, long time. And uh, this I have great. Uh, Great hopes for, as my grandma used to say, many a nickel makes a muckle. So the full saying is, is many a little makes a nickel, and many a nickel makes a muckle. You can actually find that in your Apple dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that in almost all of the VMs that I've worked on, quality of implementation is worth a factor of two or four. So you can take a good algorithm, and you can almost always polish it to another. Another factor of two. So quality of implementation is very important. But without a tool like this, you're absolutely running blind. You have no idea what's, what's going on. You have to invest in, in good profile tools. So um, the fast chip, uh, I should be starting on very soon, and hope that in April 2009 there'll be an x86 port. And then you know ARM, um, etc. will will follow as, as people get involved. And the the basic thing that you do um, to map uh, stack bytecodes to register codes is uh, the translator looks like a little interpreter, and it pushes descriptors on a, on a stack that say things like I'm an instance variable at this offset, or I'm a temporary variable at this offset. But you don't actually generate the code. For accessing those parameters until you have, you get to to an op which actually does something like a send, at which point you can then consume the, the artificial arguments that you've got on the stack and generate register code for them. It's a very simple way of, of, of mapping the stack to, to registers. It's very, very fast. Um, you get really good speed by having self and the last two arguments in registers. So things like app book never accesses the stack, the receiver, and index and the, the value to be stored are, are in registers so it goes much faster. Um, and it will have an, an inline cache uh, with polymorphic inline caches to, to uh, help speed up sends and eventually feed type information to the to the fast <coughs> fa <coughs> chip. Um, if it's got two things that are, that are sort of new, this isn't fantastically new, but um, it's a good idea, I think. Um, and we'll have a more um, open translation, as I said, we'll retain the interpreter. So let me go into those last uh, two points. Um, so what's a two-word object header? So a uh, two-word object header is a way of having the same object representation, more or less, in a 64-bit and a 32-bit VM. And if you look at a 64-bit VM, if you were to waste 64 bits in the class, uh, that's, that's great, you have lots of classes, and, and it, it's, it's great, but it's really terrible for the inline cache, because the inline cache is for all classes. And um, quiz, how many instructions uh, 
does it take on a, on a spark, 64-bit spark, to synthesize an arbitrary 64-bit literal, which is what you need if you want to synthesize a class. If you want to load a register with a 64-bit with a class, you have to construct the literal, which is the address of that class. So how, how, many, how many instructions does it take on a spark? Four. No. No. Six. So you form a 32-bit literal with a push high and a, and, a, and a low, and then you form another with a set high, so low, and then you shift, and then you warp. And so I make that like three 64-bit words to synthesize an arbitrary one. So we go from a 50% overhead to a 66% overhead, my maths, something like that. It's a mix, it doesn't scale. So um, what is it the 64-bit visual works? I uh, went for uh, a class in, uh, indices where there's room for 2 to the 20 classes, and that 20-bit uh, index is what you score in the um, inline cache. So in the, in the VM, you don't actually use classes directly in objects. You have an index into a, into a table. So in Squeak, you know, the, the header's a bit simpler, and we can probably get away with, with a 3-byte uh, scheme. So we have a 3-byte a class table index with 2 to the 24 classes. Um, and then we'll have exactly the same size identity hash. So, so an identity hash that goes up to 2 to the 24, which is a big improvement over 12 bits or 14 bits, whatever it is now. So the idea is that, that um, you use this as your tag in all of your inline caches and your first level method of caches. And you only dereference this to actually find the class object when your method lookup actually has to go and traverse the class hierarchy, or when you use the, the class primitive. But at all other times, the VM is just using this, this index. And it's got some great uh, benefits, because the garbage collector doesn't move it. So you don't have to go over your inline caches in the garbage collector anymore when you, when you move, when you want to do a garbage collection. These indexes are constant. Um, and, um, you also don't have to um, look up these uh, these classes. So in the in a conventional VM, if you want to instantiate an array, you have to go look at some array of known classes and look at the end element, and in there is class array. And now you've got the, the address of the array object that you put in your in your new array header. Well, here you don't need to because you know array has a known index, so it's just it's just constant. So. So that's faster to, to instantiate. Um, and then the, the nice idea, why is the identity hash the same as the, as the class table index? Is because a class's ID hash is its table index. Right? So now when you want to instantiate a class, you don't have to go look up what its index in the table is, because its identity hash tells you. You have to um, make sure that classes have a special identity hash primitive, so that when you first ask, for the identity hash of a class, it enters it into the table, and you have to maintain the table as a root array to reclaim these indices and stuff. But, it, but it's, it's very nice. And uh, what's really nice about it is that we basically can have the same representation for, for a 64-bit and a 32-bit VM. Yeah. Uh, so that's nice. And then um, I'm really uh, you know, Napoleonic about trying to get lots of people to use this. I'll probably fail because I'm too eager or something. But I would love lots of other, other systems to use this. Um, I, I didn't talk enough about um, Newspeak. I, I was working with, with uh, Gilad's team at Cadence for, for 18 months and did some VM work there. And um, had a fantastic time working with, with the team. It was great fun. And I know that I want um, COG to be a faster VM for, for Newspeak as well. But Newspeak will have a different bytecode set. It's a very different language. It will have a, a, a different set of trade-offs. So one of the things you want to do is to try and, and at least make the, the, the bit that decodes bytecodes and maps them onto little code generators to, to generate the code for each bytecode to be not a big switch statement as it is in conventional VMs, like it is in, in HPS, but to be a table of functions so that you can you know, really make the, the, the the bytecode set pluggable and just have one, one header file which defines what's your bytecode set and have, have a set of, of generators which are, which are common to different languages. 
And then the really important uh, thing is to make the uh, object model an abstract data type in the code generator. So whenever the code generator wants to do things like say, I want to dereference an instance variable, it doesn't say, I'm going to do it like this. It says to some object model thing, will you do it for me? Will you generate this code? And then we can have different object representations, uh, plug, plug different object representations into the, the code generator. So that's what I mean uh, by an, an open JIT, and I hope that it'll be used for at least Coke Suite, you speak, and maybe, um, maybe it'll be tracing JITs, you know, so there may be other candidates. So then, um, You know, when I was when I was a young kid, I was taught dynamic translator. That's what Peter called his his VMs, and now it's called JITs, just in time compilers. Not, you know, just in, I mean, it doesn't even make sense, right? Where's the team? What's that? Just in time translation, just in TDM. I don't know, but but there we are. Everybody understands JITs. <laughs> so one of the things that that's that's cool is that um, there's a much better term for adaptive optimization, which is speculative inline. And that's what it is, right? You, you generate some, some inline code, but you have guards to see whether whether this inline code is, is, is going to work. So you know, I, I called, called my, my first attempt at getting this going, which which, which failed. Uh, aspect oriented sort of object uh, uh, architecture, and now it's called the speculative system. Yeah. So that's great. So it's the sister of AOS. Um, and so this is the term that the LLVM guys use, and that's that's great. So the evolution from uh, an HPS style JIT to an adaptive optimizing JIT is essentially to um, look at the inline caches and derive type information from them and, and produce efficient code based on that type information. Uh, so you have to get at the picks through some primitives, which is easy because you have these context objects for the image to, to say what's your state to. And um, you want to count conditional branches because uh, these are less frequent than sends. And if you and the, the, the point of counting is is to to um, identify what's the frequently executed part of code and when these counts trip, you invest an image level optimizer. To generate better code, and if you you uh, maintain counts for both sides of a conditional branch, then you get basic block frequency, you know, which way you've gone down each arm, and you do everything in an image level optimizer. So uh, the image level optimizer sees bytecoding methods <coughs> decorated with uh, type information from picks represented as say arrays, and generates uh, a new bytecode set with with faster operations in it. So um, that's, a, that's a small talk program that I can um, absolutely attest having done the stack VM in, um, in Squeak, what a, what a great pleasure it was to, to write the VM in small talk. Uh, I, I'm a combo. I hate slang. I think slang is disgusting. But the, the small talk model of the VM is, is superb. And that was, that was really great to get going. Um, so I have, I have wrestled with, with slang a bit to try and get it better. Um, so the image level optimizer needs to target some set that enables it to generate faster code. So you extend the VM with some uh, primitive bytecodes, which basically code for operations that would uh, generate very small numbers of instructions from. So one would be just add the top two things on the stack. And don't worry about them being small integers. I guarantee that they're small integers. And don't worry about them overflowing. I guarantee that they're overflowing. And so that translates to an add instruction instead of the, the tag checking, etc., 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 And things like an inbound, uh, you know, assume that, that the app is, is, uh, is inbound and it's to a pointer object and, and the small integer's uh, index is, is, uh, is a small integer. So that's how you do, you do it at the image level and you have a, um, a portable um, optimizer. <coughs> And a, a nice separation between the optimizer and the back end. And you have a small talk program, which means you can uh, uh, modify it on the fly. And because the image is in charge of uh, maintaining optimized methods, you can save the image hop. You don't have to wait for the system to eat every time you start it. And um, 
when you do that kind of thing, you're generating much bigger basic blocks between, between cells. So at this point, you might actually benefit from uh, interfacing with the, the low-level virtual machine as an aggressive optimizer with a large footprint and uh, it's, quite, it's quite slow. Um, it wouldn't work with the fast chip because the space between basic blocks is so small that there isn't really any, any opportunity for it to, to optimize. Once you get onto um, the adaptive approach where you've, you've produced much, much larger sequences of optimized code, then it could be worth. And it was nice to, to, to meet uh, one of the guys at Apple that I'm at LLVM recently and, and have this discussion, and he was he agreed. The right way around to do it, so that's good. Uh, well, the other part that should put me into a visual condition is probably run faster with. Say that again. Uh, well, the other is a uh, simple process. Right, and I'm, I'm still not convinced that, that um, you know, if the, if the separation isn't done right, that, that you can't get like, the, the, the code quality. But, but we'll, we'll see. And we'll do. Not, I've not played with it, so I don't know. I have to play with it first. So the the real target, I think, for the for the fast chip is good for three D port for Croquet. It's a three D graphics application that does a lot of uh, uh, work. Um, and the idea is is to have some computational model where you've got uh, a byte data stack and you've got horrible byte codes like you know take a, a, a 64 bit float from somewhere on that stack and multiply it by another and store it somewhere else. Now, if you have that kind of instruction set, the, the optimizer can, can target it and can unbox floats because now floats are raw values on this on this stack. And the code generator can map that the portion of the stack that fits directly to the floating point registers. So this should allow you to generate floating point code, which is um, as good as, as as good as C4 with, with, with caveats. So um, uh, when when is this going to be? Well, the fast chip is going to be 2009 April, and then there'll be other uh, follow-ons for different platforms. So uh, you know, 2010 early version, something like that. 2011, but but earlier if you will uh, if you will join in, become members of the Cognizante. Too many favorite parts. Yeah. There's never any one favorite part, right? When it works, it's really nice. Like with a new idea, you find out you know the bug that's been lingering for three weeks. You know what it's like. I mean, are you obsessive and compulsive enough to, to like you know, be addicted to patience when, when your morale is low? And for me, you know, playing the optimization game is is is, is great fun. It seems like uh, Spider solitaire, so it's kind of this inbuilt thing in the brain, you know, in small minded people like me, which just loves just trying to figure out the shortest possible sequence of, of instructions or something. I just find it satisfying. Uh, 
Yes. <coughs> um, so some some numbers. If you look at squeak for something like um, uh, Fibonacci, then the difference between squeak and dolphin is a factor of five, and the difference between squeak and visual works is a factor of twenty. And um, I think for most pure small dog algorithms, you definitely say that the visual works was was many times. You would say it was you know, three, four times faster. So there is a correlation, and it, and it is this kind of, of, of dilution. That, you know, maybe a third of the benchmark speed up will accrue to your application. Um, but it's very interesting looking at the difference between squeak and dolphin because they're ostensibly the same. They're both pure backward interpreters, and that's all quality of implementation. So dolphin goes down to uh, to register and uses you know, the, the, the dispatch loop was written in an assembly. Has stacks instead of contracts and stuff, um, and so the the difference between an interpreter, a really well written interpreter, because the dolphin is probably one of the world's best written interpreters, and a, a, a you know a decent mid level chip is, is, is a factor of four, and I would expect that you would see you know factors of plus thirty percent, plus fifty percent in, in application performance, on them. and that's definitely definitely. says I really need that or if anybody wants to do it then, then it's great but it's just not on my critical path I mean, one of the important things is that I'm, you know, I, I'm a very single-minded as to, as to where I want to, to get to and I'm, I'm not doing research I'm just trying to provide a, a solid reliable fast via a, a crack and, and a squeak um, and so what I, what I do want to do is make it flexible enough that it will be easy for people to do experiments like that but no I'm not There's an emerging consensus that conventional multi-threaded programming just doesn't scale. It's just too hard. And everybody is looking for alternative ways of doing it. And the workaround that the Squid community is investigating right now is Hydra, which is to have multiple images in multiple threads, one by four, and to have fast interprocess communication. And um, it's a for analogy, but if you look at the Larrabee chip, the Intel chip, they have gone not for a very, very fast system, but for lots and lots of, of, of like year 2000 Pentium with some special go faster bits. And that's the way that they're providing multi um, And there are other much more interesting programming models that, that, that people are evaluating. Um, but what I take from that is that it doesn't make sense to try and solve the, the multi-threading problem in the, in the VM and, and build a classically multi-threaded VM with a multi-threaded garbage structure and a multi-threaded detector and all of the horrible complexity and, and um, lack of reproducibility component that, that, that that implies. So um, you know, I, I'm going to be looking at uh, playing well with Hydra and making sure that we Hydra and then you know, other higher level programming models for good emerge and execution technology will, will follow that. <coughs>
We, we, we should, but not, not, not here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, you know, I, I, could, I, I, I could care less about, I mean, that's not, not true, but, no, you know, providing you generate the bytecodes, that's, that, that, that's, that's great. Right? So, it's, 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 it's doable. Yeah, yeah. Join, join the conversation. 